Um, so I think everyone heard that, that it's being recorded. Excellent. Um, just to start, I want to acknowledge that I'm on the unceded land of the Kulin Nations, and I want to give uh, my, pay my respects to the ancestors, elders, and family of the Kulin Nation. Um, we are very pleased to have another one of um, another seminar in the Sidron series, which is called Unsettled Time Trans disciplinary conversations about community, well-being and justice. I think that's a title that you would have come up with, Sam. <laughs> Blame Chris. Um, <laughs> I'm Blame Chris. me. Cool. Um, and uh, so today we're pleased to have um, Matthew Klugman, who's from the Institute of Health and Sport and a member of Sidron uh, give us a presentation, which um, I asked what originally what it was about and was told that it's about sport, but I'm reckoning that we can go a little bit more and um, but the paper is titled How Am I Meant to Represent a Country That Doesn't Represent Me? Uh, Australian Sporting Images and Transformations. And I think You'll speak for about 40 minutes, is that right, Matthew? And then we'll have some time for questions and discussion. Thank you. Over to you. And thank you very much, Nicole. Um, yeah, I'd also like to begin by acknowledging, recognising and respecting the ancestors, elders and families of the Boonwurrung, Wadawurrung and Wurundjeri of the Kulin, who are the traditional owners of the land that I work and live on. And to note that these lands were stolen and remain unceded. As a migrant to these lands and more broadly as a settler, I endeavour to ground my work and my life more generally around the foundational call of Womanjika to come with purpose. I also want to pay my respects to any other First Nations people who are in the audience today. It's a privilege to be giving a paper to Sidron. I'm very grateful to be part of this glorious community of scholars and activists, and my thanks to Roshani for undertaking the work of organising this. I'm also thankful and indebted to Chris Son, Kim Kruger, Gary Osmond and Rob Hess for their thoughts and comments when I've discussed aspects of this work for them. And to Karen Jackson, Paul Stewart, Gregory Phillips, Jordi Silverstein and Francesco Riccardi for broader yarning that has shaped my thinking and engagement with these topics. This paper is a work in progress that among other things lays the ground for um, an application, a grant application that I'm currently working on. So any thoughts um, around that? Uh, yeah, I'm uh, eager to hear them when we get to that point. A uh, word of warning as well, this paper shows and discusses some disturbing images and also has images of people who are no longer alive. Finally, I would like to dedicate this paper to the close friend of my family, Marcus Cox, who died of COVID on Tuesday evening. Among other things, he adored art and theatre in, uh, in particular, much more than he adored sport. Okay. So on May, 2000, May 6, 2021, the American underwear company Jockey announced that it was sponsoring both the Australian and Paralympic Olympic teams. The accompanying photo was provided to celebrate this sponsorship. As you can likely see in the image, something wasn't quite right. The following day, the Australian basketball star Liz Cambridge put the image on her Instagram account along with the following message. I've said it once, I've said it a million times, how am I meant to represent a country that doesn't even represent me? With the hashtag there, whitewashed Australia. So today I wanna to use this paper as a chance to, thinking through, to start thinking through Cambridge's striking question and the matters that it raises. More particularly, I wanna reflect on the visual aspects of race and sport and those other vital aspects that intersect with this, such as gender, by placing this image in a historical context. 
at issue are questions of power, the power of Australian sport and our cultural, social and political investments in it, the place sport holds in Australia, the roles it performs, the harms that it perpetuates and its potential as a site of transformation and epistemic justice. An underlying question here is what would it mean if we start to think of sport as a form of art that can bring about or facilitate meaningful change? In the late 1800s, a number of games became objects of cultural fascination to many settlers of the colonies that the British had created after invading the lands that make up the place that came to be called Australia. Sports like rowing, cricket, horse racing, boxing, rugby and Australian rules football not only drew huge crowds, they were also read about avidly in the many newspapers that reported on and shaped colonial life. Visitors from overseas marvelled at the newspaper at the passions that were directed towards these games. In 1890, in an emblematic example, J.B. wrote in a suburban Melbourne newspaper, for an Englishman to visit Australia and go home without having seen an Australian football match with its attendant multitude of ardent barrackers would be as unintelligible as for a colonial to see London and omit the tower. For what an experience it is to be at one of the big matches. What a babel of sound. What a magnificent uproar. What a glorious cloud shattering eruption of profanity. Later, the Czech communist Egon Kish Riley observed that his 1934 leap from a port onto the Melbourne docks, which would lead to an important legal challenge to the white Australia policy was looked upon as a sporting performance by this sport mad continent. Kish wasn't allowed to embark in Australia, uh, so he leapt from the boat and broke his leg. But yeah, uh, seen still as a sporting performance. The obsession with sport could frustrate trade unionists who lamented the way mere games were frequently seen as more important than the rights of workers, and also bankers who lamented the way mere games were frequently seen as more important than paid work. We can see here, for example, a cartoon complaining about the limited interest in the apparently vital issue of federation, as opposed to the zealous interest in Ashes cricket contests played between men representing Australia and England. To many critics, it seemed that like spectator sports were a dangerous form of popular culture that unleashed unruly passions which degraded those who experienced them. Put simply, it was an unhealthy distraction from the important things in life. On the other hand, sport could also be celebrated as a relatively pure, innocent endeavor that was free of politics and other such meddlesome things. Both of these perspectives relied on the erroneous presumption that sport was somehow separate from real life. Yet much of the immense meaning that spectator sports had already come to hold in Australia was due to the key scientific, medical and cultural fears that sport had seemingly helped resolve. And these were fears in particular around race and gender. The first British men to try and master Australia as they understood it, were celebrated for their manly responsibility, their self-discipline, their independence and their reason, despite their acts of invasion, violence and dispossession. Nevertheless, as the colony of Victoria boomed after the gold rush of the 1850s, these qualities of English manhood were threatened by an environment so severe, it seemed to have degenerative effect on the bodies and minds of otherwise strong white Englishmen. Melbourne's asylums, for example, appeared replete with white middle-class men deemed fragile rather than strong, irrational rather than in control, and frequently maddened rather than civilized. A couple of decades later, by the 1880s, however, a renewed medical, social and cultural optimism had taken hold that the new white Australian man was beginning to emerge that actually demonstrated improvement in type over the British stock, as Warwick Anderson put it. While perhaps rougher than his English counterparts, this new Australian type was celebrated as stronger and fairer. <laughs> 
Sport had played a vital role redeeming British masculinity in the colonies. When men from Victoria and then New South Wales defeated an English cricket team in 1874, it was taken as both a refutation of fears that the English race would degenerate in Australia and as a vindication of Australian manliness more generally. The victory showed that the British blood has not yet been thinned by the heat of Australian summers, wrote the Sydney Morning Herald. Or, as the Australasian put it, in bone and muscle activity, athletic vigour and success in field sports, the Englishmen born in Australia do not fall short of the Englishmen born in Surrey or Yorkshire. We can see in both of these the kind of focus on bodies as the concern. Two years later, the rower Ed Ned Cricket journeyed to England from Sydney, where he became the first of many Australian world champions, winning the World Sculling Championship. It was another victory that created immense pride with more than 25,000 people greeting him on his return to Sydney three months later. A belief that games like rowing, cricket and the football codes turned white boys into good, strong and fair white men took hold and a national obsession with sport was born. Read the accounts of the boat races, the cricket matches and say if our youth are not manly, pronounced the famed Australian writer Marcus Clarke a year later in 1877. Through the 1900s, the athletic white sporting man would gradually come to replace the supposedly iconic white Bushman as a representation of the nation. As Cameron Wright White has put it, great pride was invested in the visual symbol of our racially hygienic and pure, virile, militarised and natural Australian masculinity. So right from the start, the fears, concerns and desires for white male supremacy were therefore at the heart of the rise of spectator sports to a central position within Australian culture. Sport not only redeemed white masculinity, it became seen as a means of producing ideal white Australian men. The best of these men would represent white Australians at the local, national and international level. They were treated as leaders, as figures who could be identified with. Their deeds were the nation's deeds. What the cricketers did, for example, was done for the nation. In the 1930s and 1940s, Bradman's triumphs were celebrated by a multitude who somehow felt like he was playing on their behalf. These athletes frequently made the nation proud. Slights against them were taken personally by citizens throughout Australia. Thus, not only was the newly federated Australian nation treated as a white possession, as the Gonpool scholar Eileen Morton Robertson has brilliantly detailed, the achievements of successful the achievements of successful Australian sporting figures were also possessed as part of the white nation. A key aspect of this possession was enacted through visual representations of these athletes. Their bodies were subject to intense scrutiny, initially primarily through the print media and then later through the televised spectacles of sport. As with other parts of the English speaking world, such as the Brit Britain and the United States, the rise of spectator sports was accompanied by a symbolic biotic relationship with newspapers who themselves grew by facilitating and feeding an ever-growing demand for content about the deeds of sporting teams and individuals. Images of sport were central, were a central part of this coverage. These images frequently revealed the worries, dreads, dreams and fantasies of the cultures of white male supremacy, which continued to shape sport in Australia. That Australian sporting images almost always spoke to themes and race, of race and gender is not coincidental. As Michael Harris has noted, race is a complicated, fluid and unreliable subject and its definitions have shifted over time. Racial discourses, though they are discourses of power, ultimately rely on the visual in the sense that the visible body must be used by those in power to represent non-visual realities 
that differentiates insiders from outsiders. Modern racial definitions have their roots in 18th and 19th century enlightenment efforts to categorize and rank human groups as part of the project of cataloging the natural world. These projects typically placed whites at the top and blacks at the bottom of hierarchies and people with vested interests built on such ideas to support and justify European imperialist objectives. The individual physical body eventually symbolized the various ways one mem one's membership in a particular social of, of one's membership in a particular social body or body politic. So the rise of newspapers comes at a time where racial discourse and the need to show racial differences is crucial and the rise of spectator sports meets that need in part. In a similar way, gender was a huge issue, masculinity in particular in the late 1800s, but gender as well was a fluid unsettled subject that those in positions of power frequently tried to fix through representations of a visible body to represent non-visual realities. And so we can see the way notions of race and gender frequently intersect in depictions of Australian sporting figures through history. If we go here, for instance, and we look at the first Australian world champion, Ned Trickett, over here, we can see the celebratory prideful focus on his white muscular torso. Some of the sporting images available provide a counter to predominant narratives around representations of Australia. So in the early 1900s, for example, Australians have focused on representations of Australia, Australian historians have focused on representations of Australia as a little boy in need of growing up via a war. And there was this kind of lust for a war in which the nation could prove itself. But that's not the only way we can understand the nation and the sense of the nation at the time. Through sport, we get quite a different picture, at least at times, as this image, oops, this image from the Herald in 1909, the Melbourne Herald shows Australia as a strong Australian rules football playing man. And the United States instead is represented as a boy in awe of the lack of protective clothing worn by Australian footballers. So count me in, I want to do what you're doing and become the kind of man that you are. And you can see how they're each holding that flag, but this is such a strikingly different image of Australia to those of the young boy in need of proving himself. At times, the white supremacy was made explicit, such as in this eulogy to the former Australian male cricket captain, Billy Murdoch, who was acclaimed as one of the whitest after he died in 1911. So whitest there is a compliment. Generally, however, the white supremacy was implicit as in the creation of the long time iconic image of the Australian life server, Saver. This version was created here, this version created to mark the opening of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. You can see this representation here of an ideal Australian man who's white though bronzed by the sun and through the development of sporting muscles is able to save the lives of others especially of other white people. He also is there to tame the harsh environment. There's an association here, among other things, between a strong protective white male body and the proud modernity embodied in the new bridge. The lifesaver itself is a kind of striking figure because if we, when, when we say it more slowly, like the designation of someone's job as saving lives, the lifesaver, that's kind of, collapsed it and don't think about those words so much anymore, but this amazing kind of cultural figure that was uh, an emblematic, iconic version of who Australia saw itself as, or white Australia, through much of last century. These kind of images then were doing the work of nation building 
cricket was frequently also central to this process and could show who was welcome to become a citizen. So the South African born white man, Kepler Vessels, for example, was welcome to represent Australian and thus to avoid the boycott placed on South African sport due to the country's horrendous apartheid policies and practices. It was very confronting for me, at least to see him there on the stage, the national stage as this person that Australians were seemingly proud of. At times, there was also some humour around the macho white men who represented Australia. This is one of the more famous images of the Australian men's cricket team from the late 1980s. Yet when cricket had its choice in its use of image, who it saw as itself, who it saw um, representing the nation, it tended to focus on people like Brett Lee and Shane Watson over many others, including the Camilleroy descendant, Jason Gillespie, the first Aboriginal man to play for Australia. So here we see in the annual reports of Cricket Australia throughout the 2000s, a relatively diverse team, but it's never Andrew Simons who's up here. It's never any of the people who uh, represent something of a different Australia. Instead, uh, Brett Lee over and over again and Shane Watson quite a bit as well. The only two blonde, blue, blonde haired, blue eyed players in the men's team. So it's this history of exclusive representations of Australian athletes that Cam Beach was touching on when calling out that jockey ad that I began the paper with. In contrast to these celebrations of white Australian men, some images were hateful, such as this distressing Sambo cartoon of the African-American Jack Johnson before his world boxing title fight in Sydney in 1908. As Joseph Boskin has chronicled, Sampo was a favorite of white cartoonists who amplified their caricatures in the post-bellum period as part of aggressive resistance to the possibility of equal treatment. So it's after the civil war in America that we get this backlash and this intensification of racist hatred. The depictions had a particular emotional iconography that reinforced ideologies of white supremacy. The black bodies were drawn as both childish and supposedly ape-like, undermining demands for freedom, autonomy and equality by attempting to repackage black men and women, albeit in different ways, for mass entertainment as unintelligent, docile and subservient. There's a direct lineage between this and the more recent Sambo image of Serena Williams that was drawn by the Australian cartoonist Mark Knight in 2018. We can see the intense misogyny as well as racism of this image, both in its portrayal of Williams as an emotional baby and in its attempted rendering of Naomi Osaka as a civil white woman. Indeed, this possessive claiming of Osaka as a particular kind of white woman fits as much into the history of Australian sporting images as the dehumanisation of Williams. Were it to be drawn now, the cartoonist would likely represent Osaka very differently for she's spoken up and being targeted for that. In a disturbing but revealing development, the Australian Press Council found that this cartoon did not breach media standards. Nevertheless, as Michael Harris has noted, while the visual was used to try and to fix racial differences into place, racial images tended to remain unruly. They resist containment and rational controls, often doing unintended things despite uh, the will of those who have created them. We can see an example of this in that earlier Federation cartoon that I showed you. Over to the side here is a presumably Chinese man who's drawn 
uh, in the hateful manner uh, that was common at that time. At the same time, he can also be understood as marvelling at the less rational Anglo people in front of him who are going mad over a mere game of sport. So there's a way of reading this character as more rational, more civil than the white Anglo uh, men fighting over a mere game. The representations of Australian sport revealed fears that spectator sports were degrading the bodies and minds of white men. This 1895 cartoon in Punch gave, for example, a sense of, the in, of inverse evolution at work with football barracas. Note how the British looking baby matures into an adult that turns into something more babyish and less coded as white or British before losing its humanity entirely. So there's a kind of racial degradation going on in these images. A later cartoon in the Melbourne Herald depicts a freak show tent as part of the suggested halftime entertainment at a football match. One of the sites within the tent was the only ever specimen of the one-eyed barracker who has been tamed. The use of scientific language in the aid of dehumanization is striking here and brings to mind not only freak shows, but also the racist exhibitions of First Nations peoples that made up the avowedly white supremacist world fairs that were so popular in Europe, United States of America at this time. On the other hand, there are some intriguing images of non-white athletes that might be seen as positive. In 1961, for example, around half a million people attended a Melbourne parade for the men's West Indian, Indian cricket team that had been led for the first time by a black captain, Sir Frank Worrell. In a similar way, Melbournians lined the streets, the streets in 1968 to celebrate Good Jamara man Lionel Rose's world boxing title victory in Tokyo. These are images of considerable power that affected some people deeply, but they did not greatly disrupt Australia's systemically racist laws and practices. The adulation of the West Indies did not, for instance, lead to changes in the white Australian migration policies nor did the celebration of Rose's victory diminish races in Melbourne or places like Pingley, where there was a curfew against Aboriginal people being in the town. As we saw more recently with Adam Goods, non-white athletes can be beloved until they speak out about the past and present of Australian racism. It, indeed, an argument could be made that many white people sought to possess the glorious achievements of Rose and the West Indian cricketers without ceding any of their own power and privilege. So what I want to ask, are the, are the, are the opportunities to intervene in the frequently damaging colonial nation building that has been enacted through the sporting images that I've shown today. I want to approach this question by first thinking about just what kind of thing these spectator sports are. In the 1880s, as spectator sports were beginning to emerge as an absurdly powerful form of popular culture, an English newspaper was created called The Umpire. This paper set out to cover the worlds of local entertainment in the north of England, particularly those pertaining to theatre and sport. And for a short time, it had this as the subheading of sporting, athletic, theatrical and general newspaper. The umpire succeeded to the extent that it became the first English Sunday paper outside of London to prosper. But it prospered because it quickly realised that sport could be covered in a different way to other forms of entertainment. 
In particular, it built on the hunger for stories that fueled the anticipation and meaning surrounding the unscripted sporting encounters that occurred every week. And these stories slowly crowded out the coverage of the theatre and other forms of news. So the amount of pa pages de devoted to the theatre kind of goes down over time and the amount of pages devoted to sport starts to dominate in the newspaper. As a non-sports writer at the umpire lamented in 1896, the sporting editor possesses the most abnormal gluttony for space ever known to journalistic man. So if that was a kind of moment of differentiation between these different forms of popular culture and that, that differentiation is so strong now that people who look at popular culture in general tend not to look at sport, whereas people who analyse, the scholars who analyse sport tend to not to look at other forms of popular culture. But what happens if we set aside those key differences between sport and, say, theatre, as well as other art forms and think about the similarities instead. Of course, I'm not the first to do this. Sporting performances have been analysed as forms of drama. The aesthetics of sport have been extensively critiqued and sporting images have been examined through the lens of visual arts. Yet few connections have been made between the practice of thinking about art as a site of cultural, social and political intervention and the possibility for thinking about sport in similar ways. If we turn to art, as Thomas Teo has noted, a critical work of art can provide the possibilities for resisting the processes of subjectification. The Wemba Wemba and Gutenjamara scholar and artist Paola Bella has explored the long tradition in Australia of Aboriginal women artists and activists using art, among other things, to disrupt colonial and patriarchal narratives in public spaces. Meanwhile, the Gumbanjia scholar and activist Gary Foley has frequently spoken of the power of theatre to change people's minds and to change the political direction and the direction of communities. The Maruna Druju scholar and art, art artist Kim Kruger has reflected on much, one such example where the Yorta Yorta athlete, activist and spiritual leader Sir Doug Nichols and Yorta Yorta activist and entrepreneur Bill Onus created and performed Out of the Dark, an Aboriginal Moomba to protest celebrations of the centenary of Victoria and the Commonwealth Jubilee. And Doug Nichols' involvement in this is really interesting as someone who tried consciously for their whole life to leverage their sporting fame to bring about positive change. However, the question is not whether sport has this potential to be like art in these moments. It's rather how have athletes and activists drawn on the visual performative power of sport to disrupt colonial and patriarchal narratives and to change minds, politics and the directions of communities. Because there's already a long history of such actions in Australia and elsewhere. The 1968 Black Power salute at the Mexico City example, Olympics is the most famous example. But there's plenty of images in Australia that are worth thinking through as transformative actions and performances. One such set of compelling images involves Foley and some other Aboriginal men wearing the jerseys of the South African men's rugby team, the Springboks, that were supposed to be reserved for white men only. And there's this kind of fascinating moment where um, Foley and another Aboriginal man um, are racially profiled, taken inside a police state, like taken inside the hotel where the Springboks are. And because they think they've stolen those jumpers, they've been given to them um, by a former Australian player. Um, and the Springbok team has to kind of um, say who's lost their jumpers and they're kind of forced to confront these, uh, this moment. Uh, the, the, the image of them wearing tops that were supposed to be reserved for white men only. Another set of images are those that were created by the Biruguba and Kuku Yelanjli athlete, Kathy Freeman, who sought to use the Australian fascination with sport to compel the nation to engage with Aboriginal sovereignty and the nation's racist past and present. These are some of the more famous images of Freeman. And this one here 
particularly notable in 1994 when she goes to the Commonwealth Games in Canada and packs that flag so that she can create it. Uh, Freeman influenced in part by um, meetings with Foley that she'd been having um, the previous few years. She also, just before leaving for those Commonwealth Games, curates this extraordinary image here that was printed on the front page of the Herald Sun and then largely forgotten before, strangely, being printed on the front page of the Australian newspaper this year and still not making that much of an impact, but extraordinary kind of image and, you know, shows the lie in the general Australian understandings of Freeman as this kind of naive, apolitical um, Aboriginal woman. She was not naive, but not listened to either, typically by white Australia. And then there are the images from Australian rules football. So most famously, the Noongar AFLM athlete, Mickey Winmar, declaring that he was black and proud in the face of racist abuse from opposition players and fans. Again, we can understand this as an act of sovereignty. It's hard to possess him in that moment, although the AFL has tried by marketing itself as solving racism in its response to this statement of pride and demand for justice. There's also Adam Goods's powerful naming of the racist abuse he suffered, along with the war dance he did once he started being racially vilified by the act of booing. Sometimes the act of just playing itself can be a powerful performative act of resistance, among other things, as it was when Taylor Harris was photographed superbly kicking an Australian rules football in, another, in the most recent Australian sporting image to become iconic after trolls um, set upon it and demeaned Harris and other AFLW players before AFLW fans um, kind of started celebrating that image. And building on these actions, we were in a moment where athletes and teams in taking a knee, they're quite clearly trying to use that visual power of sport for a performative act. At the same time, AFLW players and then later the AFLM players followed their lead of wearing free the flag shirts before their matches. While the most recent glorious image from Australian sport is that of Mel Jones watching the Nagarugu tennis player Ash Barty win Wimbledon while wearing an always was, always will be t-shirt and being seen every time uh, either player was serving towards the end that she was sitting behind. So in a key model for my work, James E. Brunson III has examined the images of black baseballers and baseball followers in the Gilded Age after the Civil War from 1871 to 1890. Among many other things, Brunson notes how baseball became a site where white America reacted against the spectre of the new black leisure class by, create, by using the imagery and caricatured language of minstrels to degrade African-American baseball players and fans. But Brunson also explored the unruly images that resisted such negative forms of subjectification and those visual moments that offered scope for transformation and justice. I'm calling for a similar history of the visual iconography of Australian sport that goes beyond simply documenting these images to grapple with the question of the harms that many images have been part of and also seeks to explore the ways that visual aspects of sport can be a side of transformation. One output that I would like from my proposed project is the creation of a series of teaching resources developed for the kind of particular curriculum of high schools around Australia that helps foster visual literacy around sport 
and an engagement with how sport might be a site of intervention, transformation, sovereignty and justice, as well as injustice. Yet it also needs to show how the power of many of these images continues to be resisted, of how, for example, the stories that are told about the actions and experiences of Kathy Freeman, Nikki Winmar and Taylor Harris are frequently made palatable to provide neat resolutions to the confronting issues that they raise. There's a need then as part of this work to wrestle with how to refuse and continue to disturb such narratives that stop at possession and evade the demands for transformation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. That was really interesting and really interesting as well. After I think Diane did the last um, Sidron seminar and there are so many intersections there mm -hmm. between the way that she was talking about visual representation and racialization in Australia. I think we've got about 15 minutes for comments and questions. And it also intersects with a lot of people's research interests. So I'm sure there's a lot of questions, comments. Um, can I, sorry, I'm just gonna turn my, excuse my unkempt, unwell appearance. Um, that was great, Matthew. I found it really interesting, um, especially as someone who has not um, grown up fond of sports. And I think coming from my own kind of strange cultural background, I, I think part of my turning away from sports is not just being a, a, a woman and a feminist and not feeling like any of it is about me or addresses me in any way, but also seeing my my Asian um, African family kind of deal with their exclusion from that model of masculinity. And when you were talking about the Asian figure, looking on kind of more civilised, I, I didn't read him that way. I had this very, and it's a very gut reaction, so it's not based in anything other than experience. I, I felt that he was lacking in, in cultural capital. And I think there's um there's something really interesting in, in the way in which non-white migrant men have had to perform around sports. So my, my father would talk about, my father and my uncle who was then from Yugoslavia, they would put each other's teams down by calling each team a a pack of garlic munchers. That was the common, it was the 80s. Um, but, you know, there's something around um, sports perhaps not hailing everyone that I wondered if you were going to explore. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, and yeah, I think that um, that particular image can be read in lots of ways and clearly part of what's happening is an exclusion. Um, yeah, um, I think my point is that, that there, there's also a kind of, um, it, it, it's also um, showing a group of people going mad and he's the one not going mad and, and there's a concern over that madness. So, so he can be like in a situation where others were seen as more emotional, here it's showing the Anglos uh, as more emotional. And so there's a trickiness there. But I think like part of what I want to work with in this project is, is to show how central the, those notions of white masculinity and, and of course you know who gets to be white changes over time but um that that gets to be seen as central and and other yeah any inclusion that happens is still on those kind of white male terms and so it's provisional and um and it, it very easy for those other figures to feel out of place or to be to be made to seem out of place and anyone who speaks up in that moment is told that, well actually they should be just be grateful for being included you know? yeah. so the dynamics of that space yeah is one in which other people are not hailed and um and only kind of only welcome on the on the terms um 
you know, of, of the colonial um, culture, um, you know, shaped by those versions of white supremacy. And so, you know, you then get to see it in the insults. Um, you get to see it in the way with both soccer and cricket, um, where those are sports where those migrants not understood of as white weren't welcome in the existing teams, but then when they set up their own teams, <laughs> that's seen as a betrayal, you know, mm. they've broken the contract. And so, yeah, I think that's a key aspect. And the body and kind of even the kind of garlic stuff is, is kind of like it's, it's that, you know, it's an embodied act, that eating of the garlic, hey, which mm. is, and, and it's a bodied act, the smelling of it, um, which becomes that marker of, of difference as well. So I'm really interested in the way the bodies are central to that with, through through process of visualisation. Yeah. yeah, and I think there's a colonial hierarchy that I can see people like my dad's family participating in that he looks down on AFL because he thinks AFL fans are really, really unruly, but um, he comes from a, a country with a very um, complex history of colonisation, but he seems he sees uh, football or, or soccer as a more refined sport. And, um, and I've had to argue with him that you know, their fans are just as unruly, especially if you've lived in the UK for any period of time. But there's a, I think, sport, there's a process of colonisation or there's a colonial ranking in, in sport in Australia as well. So it'd be interesting. Yeah, and we see, that with, we see that with cricket cricket um a little bit with rugby union um as well yeah and then it depends where you've come from in terms of association football yeah yeah indeed uh tom thanks nick uh, th thank you matt it's so nice to um so nice to see and hear your work again it feels like ages i don't, don't remember when we anyway um um so, so uh Sport and culture, culture and sport, uh, is is such a um, such, an, such an obvious, such an obviously productive joining, isn't it? And and people in, in in places have done it in various ways, but but to try to um, to try to use it as a vehicle for for talking about Australian culture and Australian history um, is is is, is it, it, it feels inexhaustible. It, you know, like it, we, we can do so much with that. I. I kept on thinking as, as you're going along. So you, you and in the conversation with Natalie just now as well, you, you you're mentioning ways of of reading, ways of analysing these sources. That I th I'm, I'm I'm sure in a, you know given time enough, you could we, you could kind of set out a methodology, but 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 the ways of reading, the way the, the ways of seeing, the way uh, the ways of interpreting are so central to what you're trying to do that i that that that, that in, in you know i'm kind of i, I feel like i was looking I, I'm, I'm looking for the follow-up that tells us about about your ways of interpreting on in in a sense uh, the, the, you know like the the, the 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 chapter two is begged by the chapter one and also and and just and and I mean, think this from the kind of the, the you, you mentioned you're you're lining up for a grant later on so i've been thinking about it from that perspective Related point then is um, we're talking about ways of we're, we're, we're talking about ways of producing messages, right? Of of of, of producing symbolic imagery, of of, of 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 moving through space and signifying by that movement, you know, the war dance and and what have you. There's a partner to it, isn't there? Which is how people interpret that, what people make of it, and 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 a little bit like Natalie, what Natalie was saying. You know, different people can take these things in different ways, but a, but but a history that can that that can account for the ways that people interpret it and receive it. I think my I think that that that, that might be the really strong kind of thing that that ha, that ha, that ha, enough, that hasn't happened enough in Australia before. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, I think you're um, you're completely right in that. Um, yeah. What I'm trying to do is to say, like, these images have often been discussed as as art, but it's not. It, it's it's it hasn't tied into those notions of art that are interested in in as much in the questions of agency and 
intervention uh, and those critical spaces trying to trying to facilitate change. And so I think part of my reading is around questions of agency, especially, um, you know, intentionality is always tricky. And, audi though. and audiences, or, audiences or publics have their agency, their intentionality as well. Yeah, audience, wanna, or, yeah, 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 for sure. Um, the, in, the question of audiences and, and maybe, you know, what we might kind of call audience, um, you know, audience reception and that sort of stuff is 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 tricky. Um, I think it's I think it's got a place. Um, and you know, for instance, um, in some of the work Gary and I have done, the letters to the editor are really interesting, um, and they're one way of engaging with that around Nikki Winmar in particular, and some around Kathy Freeman as well. Um, at the same time. Um, the Herald Sun, after it publishes that extraordinary front page around Kathy Freeman, never pump, doesn't publish one letter to the editor about it. You know, this is the time of Marbo, uh, the time of debates around weak, um, you know, in a, you know, intensely uh, vital um, debates, you know, it's a year after the Nikki Winmar image and they don't publish one. So that kind of... <clears throat> um, you know that that's that's a real limit on on trying to get a sense, and then if we go back earlier, even more so in try in terms of trying to get a sense of how these things are received. So um, I am interested in that aspect, but I'm wary about uh, foregrounding it as the primary method methodological take. For me, it's it's more about. Um, yeah, the critical engagement with what are these images doing um, and what might they do as well and, and how can we kind of, how can we read them really in, as, as political? Um, yeah, so the different ways of, of that, you know, and if it, you know, in terms of being shaped by, um, by the methodology Foley has talked about in terms of theatre and not just Foley, but that, that political theatre. You know, theatre is a direct <clears throat> politics, and, and you know this goes to Chris Son's work as well. You know, I uh, see so he's written about you know witnessing pedagogy. What types of, of that is possible? So yeah, maybe maybe the audience also comes in in a, terms of a question of what kind of audience responses are po are made possible through these images. Um, mm. Because another yeah. thing. <clears throat> sorry, quickly, just to... Oh, no, sorry, sorry yeah, Another thing that's part of that is, like, the way that Winmar image c continually gets told in ways that kind of defang it, you know, particularly when the AFL is trying to tell it. <laughs> it's trying to shape a reading of it. And even with the Kathy Freeman one, like, it's... And the Winmar one, it's really interesting looking at captions. Like once we start getting captions used, it's really interesting to see the work of those captions, um, which change like with both Winmar and Freeman. You can see the uh, the captions for the first edition that's published and then the second edition that's published and that kind of try and make it more palatable, you know, and, and try and remove the, the kind of confronting aspects of it. So does that make sense, Tom? But I, I do think, yeah, methodologically, it, it, it's it's um, it's the key thing, and 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 that I hadn't uh, got to so much in this paper. Yeah. Um, Gary, we might have one more question, Gary. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks, team. Greetings from Brisbane, uh, Matthew. I really enjoyed this paper, and um, I haven't talked with you about your. Um, you know, your plans or your hopes to um, develop curriculum materials for schools. And I think that's really, really great. Um, so I just wanted to ask related to that, I guess, I mean, given that images have polysemic meanings and each viewer has their own or adopts their own perspective and given the contested nature of images and the fact that there are so many challenges and denials and attempts to defang, as you say, what are the conditions for an image to become transformative or what's required 
to help that process along? Yeah, I think I think that's I think like particularly when we're talking about moving something into the realms of curriculum, uh, and then each state typically has its own. <laughs> you know, there's the national curriculum, and then each state's take on it. Um, but I'm really interested in the in the possibilities of working with that, and I know that the um, Australian Aboriginal Ar uh, History Archive, um, you know, Foley's archive is also starting to um, think through some of those questions as well. Um, for me, it's it's around a couple of things. Like, I don't think we can make it didactic. You know, I don't think curriculum works when you say, this is what you have, you know, <laughs> this is the lesson, uh, these are the answers and that sort of stuff. So for me, it's around questions. And I think you can frame both, both some, some materials that are that label entry points, but particularly that foreground those things. So I think if we're thinking, for instance, if there's also questions of intellectual copyright that I think are really important. So um, like I think, of, you know, if, if we're talking about that Freeman image, um, you know, there's a question, but that's her image. Obviously, Ludby, who took the photo, also has some copyright around it. But, you know, so those there's some questions around that. But given how much she has tried to continually bring that, I think um, we can imagine that she might say yes to that being used. But then it's, you know, some of her particular points around it and, and the kind of, so I think some of the readings like this, but then the questions you're asking people, uh, and I think you can bring right out into the public, like say the windmill stuff. I think you can say some people, you know, the AFL tells the story this way. <laughs> you can also tell the story that way. Which way, you know, which, you know, consider these two different ways of telling the story and say which one you think is, um, uh, is more legitimate, you know, uh, is, you know, to use that word we don't always use, but more truthful. Um, you know, or what are the meaning, you know, what are, the, you know, or even what does it mean if we believe this version of the story or we, or we take, you know, we tell the story this way or we tell it that way. So I think um, it gets in partly into the powers of stories. And, and that's another thing with these images, hey, is that the images are as much as um, some people might say, um, the images speak for themselves, the images never only speak for themselves. There's always forms of mediation that, that we know about. And so getting, I think also getting students, like for me, one of the key things I want to do is to try and create more visual literacy. And so, you know, when I teach my history of Australian sport unit, one of the key things out of that is I'm, I'm constantly showing these images, quite a lot of the ones we've gone through today, constantly showing them to students and asking them, what's happening here? <laughs> like help, like, like let's, let's analyze it. Let's, because we live in such a visual world and yet those tools of visual literacy are, are, are so lacking, you know? And, and then you get the kind of innocence and, and all that sort of stuff that arises from not actually realizing what the image says. But it's hard work because at the end of my unit, when I show that uh, horrendous Mark Knight cartoon, um, half of my students are typically around, you know, a third to half of my students say initially that they don't think it's racist. So there's a quiz question which says, why does Matthew Klugman think that this is racist? And they need to understand why. I, and then I go through, you know, and I go through the reasons for them and hopefully they have a clearer sense there. But, but there's, yeah, it's not, I don't think any of this stuff, I don't think when we're talking about teaching it and yeah, maybe the limits of education and, and stuff. It, it's, it's not easy. <laughs> uh, there's a heap of resistance that we're coming up against in terms of going against these dominant frameworks. Thank you. And I think we're going to have to um, leave it there just looking at the time. So I'll um, ask everyone to thank Matthew and we will look forward to hearing more about your project. Thanks very much for having me.